All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, we're going to get started real soon with today's lecture, so let me go add that to the stream. I hope that you are all doing incredibly well this uh, fine Sunday afternoon. Um, apologize for starting an hour late, just I had to take care of some things here at home before I could get started. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, so today is going to be the second part of our series on George F. Kennan, more or less the man that, whether he liked it or not, is one of the most foundational pieces to the American policy and positions in the Cold War. And uh, we're going to continue on. Uh, last week, we had a much shorter lecture discussing the uh, early life, education, his time within the U.S. Uh, Foreign Service as part of the newly reformed Foreign Service after the Rogers Act. And from there, we're now going to talk about what he's really well known for, which is his time uh, serving both in the policy planning staff as the director, his time with the Cold War's influence on George C. Marshall. Uh, we're going to spend a bit of time today reading on the long telegram, but I'm going too much now off on myself uh, because I have this all outlined. But for all of you who are just uh, beginning to tune in now, uh, welcome, and I hope that you're all having a fantastic Sunday, whether it's the morning, afternoon, evening, or even tomorrow in some time zones. So, um, yeah, outline for today's lecture is going to be primarily on his time during the Cold War. Uh, this is an image from his conversation with Time Magazine in the 1950s. Um, so we will go over the long telegram, uh, Kennan's policy ideas for what containment is, uh, his time both within the Truman and Eisenhower administration, his short-lived ambassadorship to Russia, um, as well as his time in Yugoslavia. But there's so much that we're going to cover that this outline is just going to give you a rather brief taste. So I'm going to go hide my face here. And um, let's uh, get started then, shall we? All right. So uh, after the long vacation, because after we had left off in the late 1940s during the time, uh, his clashes with FDR as well as going, you know, past his superiors had left him to be, um, you know, returning to the European Advisory Commission However, he found himself in Moscow once again in the summer of 1944. Uh, to the right, you'll see a picture of um, Ambassador W. Averell Harriman, um, who has personally had requested Kennan to be there, given that Kennan had a strong relationship towards um, you know, the Soviets. Uh, he had a strong understanding of them, both in terms of Russian history. He was the first to be a specialist in Russian and Soviet affairs in the new foreign service uh, and this was important because Harriman was not the world's most uh, well-read man on Russia. In fact, he was a loyalist to FDR. He was more of an, a political appointee, someone that FDR could easily control, someone that FDR had um, you know, relied on, if we want to review our, our policy of selectorate theory. Um, you know, Harriman was that kind of man that was vital, you know, in raising funds, uh, mainly a political loyalist. But he did call for the support and assistance of those um, who actually knew what they were doing. And so he asked for um, Kennan personally. Um, so, however, during this time, as we'll find out in the great book, it came out in 1989 about uh, George F. Kennan, um, the Cold War iconoclast, that during this time, uh, working both within FDR, but especially working under Harriman, that um, this was something of which had undermined his faith in democracy further, uh, in part because a democracy, in Kennan's view, could not create a sustainable long-term foreign policy that served the national interest or the interests of its citizens when you know various presidential figures could at whim elect and appoint and have individuals appointed based upon political merit and assistance to a political campaign, um, Kennan wrote that it would be impossible for a democratic society to maintain a strong foreign policy, especially towards more autocratic states before. And this is something, of course, that Kennan had wrote throughout his life, especially in the 1920s and 30s, when he had just gotten his start in the foreign service that was primarily oriented towards strong centralized systems, um, not having it floated out towards democracy. 
and being at the whims of the public opinion, which could give way to baser instincts on policy and not what he believed to be rational. So on the, the right here, you'll see an image of Harriman himself. Um, uh, what had grown out of this, however, was a inability to really cooperate with the Soviets. Uh, he had found this as he continued to work in Moscow. He had discovered himself as the uh, minister counselor that the uh, current policy of conciliation, that post-war uh, sort of strange era of, you know, engaging in sort of the, you know, World War II activities, was that the Soviet Union began to, of course, intercept various diplomatic communiques. They wouldn't allow diplomatic pouches to be handed over without inspection. Um, you know, allowing the American press to report on Soviet things became censored. Basically, the foundations of the Cold War is the Soviet Union found themselves more and more distrustworthy of the American forces and the American diplomatic corps. Um, this is where our good friend, Mr. Kennan, realizes that things are not going the way that they should, and that the current policy out of FDR until FDR's death would, you know, be something that he would write numerous criticisms of and would try and convince, and later would convince, um, President Harry Truman to take over and do so um, before the 1948 election. Uh, this lack of cooperation and the growing militarization and the growing presence of espionage between the Soviet Union and the United States after the end of the Second World War um, pressured Kennan to argue to the American government that we cannot continue this conciliatory diplomatic form of detente that was needed as a vital way to end the war um, against Germany and Japan. So uh, with that, we get sort of the um, most uh, intense, I, I like to compare it to like an internet comment where someone will ask a question to somebody and then someone totally not privy to the conversation um, will uh, interject and provide an answer. Um, and sometimes that answer doesn't always uh, provide us um, with an actual answer. So it's an answer, but non-answer posed by the Treasury Department. Um, you know, George F. Kennan was, uh, had become privy, of course, to the uh, question that was posed by the Treasury Department. And it was asking the State Department to just explain Soviet behavior. Uh, why didn't it want to endorse the International Monetary Fund? Why didn't it want to join the World Bank? They were very curious as to why the, the Soviet Union in this um, era of trying to create you know, global institutions to help sort of rebuild the post-war world, and by extension, of course, exert American influence as it would be used during the Cold War and even to today to some extent, um, although there are competing institutions, I'd argue, from other um, international groups and other nations. But in February 22nd, 1946, uh, Kennan provides an answer to the Treasury Department, um, even though it wasn't necessarily his role. Uh, this gave Kennan the opportunity to voice his frustrations and offer alternatives to the post-war uh, continuation of con uh, conciliation and negotiation. This uh, telegram is over 5,000 words long. We're going to do a little bit of reading of it today. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get there. Although sometimes it's cited for being more than 8,000 words. I wonder if that's due to the breaks. But uh, it's about 5,363 words. Um, and this was sent uh, from Moscow to Secretary of State James Burns, outlining a new strategy for diplomatic relations to the Soviet Union. Um, this is where we uh, get the policy of containment, and this would later be flushed out when he would write fully as Mr. X in Foreign uh, Affairs magazine. Now, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that article in just a little bit, but it's actually quite funny because, because Mr. Kennan, as I had described in our first stream, is sort of the, uh, you know, OG, uh, you know, historical, you know, classics autist who would carry around copies of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire uh, with him on his person, that it became kind of easy to find out who actually wrote this uh, article. But we're going to share our screen now. We're going to read some bits and pieces of the long telegram today, and there's quite a few here that I thought would be important for us to discuss. So I'm going to stop screen here real quick, and we'll move to the next tab over, which is Kennan's The Long Telegram. Okay, so here we go. All right, this was sent at 1046 on February 22nd. Um, yeah, 9 p.m. received 3.52. Sorry, I'm reading the above charge here. Um, February 22nd, 1946, 9 p.m. received 3.52 p.m. Uh, over in Washington. 
uh, an answer to the um, Treasury Department's question are so intricate, so delicate, and so strange to our form of thought and so important to the analysis of our international environment that I cannot compress answers to a single brief, brief message without yielding what I feel would be a dangerous degree of oversimplification. I hope, therefore, the Department will bear with me if I submit in this answer to this question five parts, subjects of which will be roughly as follows. One, basic features of post-war Soviet outlook. Two, the background of this outlook. Three, its projection and practical policy on an official level. Four, its projection on an unofficial level. Five, practical deductions from the standpoint of U.S. policy. And of course, he's going to apologize in advance for burdening the channel, but here they are. Part one, basic features of the post-war Soviet outlook as put forward by the official propaganda machine. They are as follows. A. The USSR still lives in an antagonistic capitalist encirclement in which the long run there can be no permanent peaceful coexistence, as stated by Stalin in 1927 to the delegation of American workers. Quote, in course the further development of the international revolution, there will emerge two centers of world significance, a socialist center drawing to itself the countries which tend towards socialism, and a capitalist center drawing itself to the, in the countries that incline towards capitalism. Battle between these two centers for command of the world economy will decide the fate of capitalism and communism in the entire world, end quote. B. Capitalist world is beset with internal conflicts inherent of the nature of a capitalist society. These conflicts are insoluble by means of peaceful compromise. The greatest of them is between that of England and the U.S., which later, of course, throughout the Cold War, we would see the deterioration of the colonial holdings, and especially that in the Suez Crisis. The internal conflicts of capitalism inve inevitably generate wars. Wars thus may be generated by two kinds, intra-capitalist wars between two capitalist states and wars of intervention against socialist worlds. Smart capitalists vainly seek escape from inner conflicts of capitalism and incline towards the latter. B. Intervention against the USSR, while it would be disastrous to those who undertook it, would be renewed to delay the progress of Soviet socialism and thus therefore be forestalled at all costs. Uh, Kennan is outlining more or less what the Soviet public outlook is to the rest of the world through its ideology. Uh, Kennan is inherently focused on the ideology of the Soviets, and this would become something, become something of a matter in which actually generates long-term disagreement with the more militarized policy that would emerge from the policy of containment. Uh, the United States would, of course, pursue a much more militarized direction against the Soviet Union. Um, there were usually three major schools of thought. We'll get into those later. But Kennan is viewing this primarily by outlining the ideological precepts that this is going to be an ideological battle and one that, of course, has geopolitical and existential implications. Um, and so and by providing the Russian perspective through its propaganda machine, we can now provide a background to these outlooks, uh, especially because these battles will always be waged against socialist or social democratic leaders abroad by democratic progressive capitalism. Um, so the background for this outlook, he argues that we have to understand the ramifications of the party line and why the current government at this point in time, uh, Stalin's government, is acting the way that it does. He is very quick to emphasize, quote, first, it does not represent the natural outlook of Russian people. Latter are, by and large, friendly to the outside world, eager for experience of it, eager to measure against its all talents that they are conscious of possessing, eager above all to live in peace and enjoy the fruits of their own labor. Party line only represents thesis of which official propaganda machine puts forward with great skill and persistence to a public and often remarkably uh, resistant in the stronghold of its innermost thoughts. But party line is binding for the outlook and conduct of the people who make up the apparatus of power, the party, the secret police, and government. And in it, it's exclusively that we have these to deal with. Um, secondly, uh, please note on these premises which the party line is based on are four, par are four parts simply not true. Experience has shown that peaceful and mutual profitable coexistence between that of capitalist and socialist states is entirely possible. Basic internal conflicts in advanced countries are no longer primarily arising out of capitalist ownership of means of production, but are ones arising from advanced urbanism and industrialism, as such which Russia has thus far been spared, not by socialism, but only by her own backwardness. Internal rivalries of capitalism do not always generate wars, and not all wars are attributable to this cause. To speak of possibility of intervention against the USSR today, after the elimination of Germany and Japan, and after the example of recent war, in the sheerest nonsense, if not provoked by forces of intolerance and subversion, quote, capitalist world of today is quite capable of living at peace with itself and Russia. Finally, no sane person has reason to doubt sincerity of moderate socialist leaders in Western countries 
nor is it fair to deny success of their efforts to improve conditions for working populations whenever, as in Scandinavia, they have been given chance to show what they could do. Although, keep in mind, and we'll talk about this later as we discuss the Marshall Plan, uh, Kennan is not a fan of giving uh, moderate socialist leaders in Western countries, especially in post-war Europe, any chance or platform. Um, falseness of these premises, every which one predates the recent war, was amply demonstrated by that of the Anglo-American differences that did not turn out to be major differences in the Western world. Capitalist countries, other than those of the Axis, showed no disposition to solve their differences and joining a crusade against the USSR. Instead of imperialist war turning into civil wars and revolution, the USSR has found itself obliged to fight side by side with capitalist powers for an avowed community of aim. Um, nevertheless, these claims are baseless and disproven. Um, boldly put being forward what today. It indicates that the Soviet party line is not based on any objective analysis of the situation beyond Russia's borders, that it has indeed little to do with the conditions outside of Russia. That arises mainly from basic inner Russian necessities, which existed before the war and existed today. Um, Kennan is arguing that more or less the uh, uh, party line politics of the Soviet Union was primarily inner Russian uh, inner, only George would write a telegram this long. Yeah. Um, and in turn, however, uh, you know, Kennan had found himself, uh, to be growing with great concern over how the Soviet unions would act. He argued within the telegram and would argue in later policy papers that he felt that the Soviet union by the nature of its post-war outlook and its current inter-party line status being primarily in a Russian and ideologue for the public view, widely the international community, um, that the Russian, uh, or by the Soviets, I should say, were in turn overextended geographically in their ability to project power. Now, in the long term, he's probably, he's proven correct on this, because at no point in time during the Cold War did the Soviet Union and the territories that it had controlled had ever reached a GDP parity with the United States and her allies. Uh, as Barry Posen had pointed out in his great book in 2000, I want to say 11, um, Restraint, uh, A New Grand Strategy for the United States, Foreign Policy, that uh, at no point in time during the Cold War um, did the ratio in GDP ever change between the Soviet Union and the United States. The U.S. maintained a solid two-to-one uh, GDP advantage in terms of economic productivity um, in this regard. So, uh, but to carry on, he found that the Kremlin uh, worldview of affairs was neurotic and traditionally instinctive of uh, a Russian xenophobia. It was... Um, of a peaceful agricultural people trying to live on a vast exposed plain in the neighborhood of fierce nomadic peoples. Uh, this was added as Russia came into contact with more economically advanced nations in the West, a fear of more competent, more powerful, and highly organized societies in the area that could again pose a substantial threat to Russia, both in terms of Tsarist Russia and now with the Soviet Union. Keep in mind that Kennan spent most of his youth and most of his time in college when he was um, you know, trying to make himself uh, something more than just some Midwestern boy um, working in the Ivy Leagues. That uh, he had spent a long time studying 19th century uh, communications of Russian diplomats. He had studied Russian authors. He had became somewhat of an authority on Anton Chekhov. And he was an individual that tried to understand the historical backing for the current Soviet policy. Because some things, like geography and history do not change. Those things are a permanent part of the way in which we view the world, especially in terms of governing the foreign policy of a country. So he argues that it was no coincidence that Marxism, which had smoldered ineffectively for half a century in Western Europe, caught hold and blazed for the first time in Russia. Only in this land, which had never known a friendly neighbor or indeed any tolerant equilibrium of separate powers, um, again, such as the Ottoman Empire or the 1905 war with Japan, uh, either internal or international, could a doctrine thrive which viewed on economic conflicts of the society as insoluble by peaceful means. After establishment of the Bolshevist regime, regime, Marxist dogma rendered even more truculent and intolerant of Lenin's interpretation and became the vehicle of a sense of insecurity with which the Bolsheviks, even more so than previous Russian leaders, were afflicted. In this dogma, with its basic altruism of purpose, they found a justification for their instinctive fear to the outside world and for the dictatorship which, without they know how to rule, for cruelties they did ne'er not inflict, for sacrifice they felt bound to demand. It was in this, the name of Marxism, that they sacrificed every single ethical value for their methods and tactics. Today, they cannot dispense with it. Um, it is the fig leaf of their moral and intellectual respectability. Uh, without it, they would stand before history at best 
as only the last of a long succession of cruel and wasteful Russian rulers that have relentlessly forced the country to ever new heights of military power in order to guarantee their external security of their internal weak regimes. Um, and again, this is Kennan's words uh, and his study of history, um, primarily just based upon its relationship to the 19th uh, and now how the United States is most likely going to act um, in, in the 20th. And he's arguing that this insecurity is the basis of Soviet action, um, not only just towards the West, but also the territories that it had carved up in the post-war agreements in sort of, you know, in Yalta, Tehran, elsewhere in the 1940s. Uh, moving down, so this comes into part three of his telegram, uh, projection of the Soviet outlook and practical policy on an official level. Uh, now, of course, that we've seen the nature and background of the Soviet program, um, what are we to expect from the Soviets looking onward, especially in relation to the sort of growing international community, this internationalism that's being led by the United States, especially because the Treasury Department is simply asking, hey, why aren't these guys endorsing the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund? Um, of course, in part due to the official party line against international capitalism, um, maintaining this sort of global revolution. Uh, Kennan's view was that now that the you know issue of fascism had been defeated, uh, now that we have seen the end of uh, the mid-century German regime, that uh, in order to maintain sort of this perpetual revolutionary cause, that it must turn itself externally away from the fascists, and it must now find itself um, in a war against international capitalism. But of course, now the real question becomes, well, what does that mean on practical policy? What are they actually going to do? So Kennan writes that on an official plane, we must look for the following. A, an internal policy devoted to ever-increasing way of strength and prestige of the Soviet state through intensive military industrialization, maximum development of armed forces, great displays to impress outsiders, continued secretiveness about internal matters, designed to conceal weaknesses and keep opponents in the dark, which I think is history has sort of given us some proof is definitely the case. B, whether it, whatever it is to be considered timely and promising, efforts will be made to advance the official limits on, of Soviet power. For the moment, these efforts are restricted to certain neighboring points conceived of here being of immediate strategic necessity, this being northern Iran, Turkey, possibly uh, Bornholm. However, other points may in time, at any time come into question. If and as concealed Soviet political powers extended to new areas, thus a friendly Persian government might be asked to grant Russia a port on the Persian Gulf. Should Spain fall under communist control, questions of the Soviet base in the Gibraltar Strait might be activated, but such claims will need to appear on an official level only when unofficial preparation is complete. Um, so some of these things actually would change American policy towards, um, one, it would definitely change policy in America towards Franco. Um, and of course, this would lead Truman to start making necessary action in Turkey and Greece um, to take a greater stand against sort of communist influences, whether local or supported. Uh, Kennan's view, both during this telegram, but also throughout the most of his time in the U.S. Foreign Service up until his resignation in 1963 and a um, move towards more public life and as an academic lecturer and writer, especially as a historian, that Kennan would believe that most, if not all, communist influences across the globe had some had not just an indirect, but primarily a direct um, link to the Soviet Union. He viewed this as, of course, an ideological stance that the Soviet Union would do whatever it can to maximize its power, even if Leninist, you know, Marxist, and various forms of socialism and communism would arise organically um, by revolutionary forces or by disaffected elites in various governments. And that will cause some issue of debate within the government that uh, Kennan finds himself constantly working in, whether that's under Truman, whether that's under Eisenhower, or, or even under John F. Kennedy. But he continues saying that Russians will continuously participate officially in international organizations where they only see opportunity of expanding and extending Soviet power or of inhibiting or diluting the power of others. Um, so the United Nations project uh, is not the mechanism for a permanent world society founded on mutual interests of names of all nations, but an arena which in aims and are just mentioned can be favorably pursued. Um, now, that sort of point has been proven true uh, from Kennan's uh, uh, issue here, primarily on the lines that even today, the United Nations is primarily an avenue in which political policy and gains can be made for the sole purpose of attracting 
um, you know, your, your nation's instituted goals or working in collaboration with other nation states to illustrate a strong sense of where your policies um, and relationship stands in, on the world stage. A most recent example of this, of course, would be the recent UN General Assembly declaration to condemn um, Russia and its invasion of Ukraine. The 35 notable abstentions are a sign not only of the, the BRICS, but secondly, also the issue of uh, the economic relationships that some nations have towards Russia, including that of India and South Africa. Uh, for example, India gets a substantial amount of its armaments from that of uh, Russia, and it has been for some time, which has also caused a bit of a concern for the Chinese, actually, which um, we will discuss in a future stream, I promise. Um, so, for example, he says, thus, the Soviet attitude towards the United Nations organization will depend largely on the loyalty of other nations to it and on the degree of vigor, decisiveness, and cohesion with which these nations defend in the United Nations organization the peaceful and hopeful concept of international life, which that organization represents to our way of thinking. Quote, I reiterate. Moscow has no abstract devotion to the United Nations organization's ideals. Its attitude towards that organization will remain essentially pragmatic and tactical, uh, which to this day it still does. Um, the sort of idealism that comes out of a liberal hegemony here in the United States, we do the same thing, albeit with a sort of a veneer of moralistic val values. Um, to, to continue on, though, I do want to get to the international economic matters. Uh, this is part F in terms of what would we expect out of Soviet policy. Um, he says that Soviet policy will really be dominated by a pursuit of autarky for the Soviet Union and Soviet-dominated adjacent areas to be taken altogether. That, however, will be the underlying policy. As far as the official line is concerned, the position, again, this was written in 1946 in February, is not yet clear. The Soviet government has shown a strange... Um, uh, reticence since uh, the termination of hostilities in the subject of foreign trade. If large, long-scale, long-term credit should be forthcoming, I believe the Soviet government may eventually, again, uh, do lip service as it did in the 1930s to desirability of building up international economic exchanges in general. Um, keep in mind, you know, this is this is in time of discussion about the Marshall Plan that will eventually come out. This is about what are we going to do to rebuild Europe. We should have international exchanges, um, the GATT, the European Community on Steel and Coal. Uh, these things are beginning to be developed at this time. Um, in the Soviet's own security sphere, including occupied areas in Germany, and that of a co official cold shoulder um, may turn to be principled to their general economic collaboration amongst other nations. But um, he finishes off saying, beyond this, Soviet official relations will take what might be called the correct course with individual foreign governments, with great stress being laid on prestige of the Soviet Union and its representatives um, with punctilious attention to protocol and distinct from good manners. So part four of five of, five of the long telegram. We'll cover some bits part here. Um, the following may be said as to what we may expect of the way of implementation of basic Soviet policies on an unofficial or subterranean plane, i.e., plane for which the Soviet government accepts no responsibilities, a little bit more clandestine. Um, agencies utilized for the promulgation of policies on this plane are the following. Uh, the inner core of communist parties in other countries, uh, with many persons composed of this categories, will appear and act in unrelated public capacities. They are in reality working very close together uh, with an underground operating directorate of world communism, Conceal a concealed common turn, tightly coordinated and directed by Moscow. Again, this is where you're seeing Kennan's view that the Soviet Union's um, influence in terms of global communism and other movements that are friendly to communism or the Soviet Union have direct control by the Soviets. It is important to remember that this inner core is actually working on underground lines, despite the legality of parties in which it is associated. And there's a lot of reason for Kennan to hold this view, um, although it was not taken directly as seriously by others within um, the State Department and other administrations throughout his time in public service. Um, we have to keep in mind that uh, Kennan, of course, this would be exposed by people by um, McCarthy. Uh, we, we know this, and at the same time, uh, former Trotskyist turn anti-communist James Burnham would write extensively on what this would actually look like, both in terms of a managerial revolution instead of a, a socialist revolution or communist revolution, um, but instead these tightly coordinated network of managers could easily be used to infiltrate or have communist alliances here. So despite this writing, for instance, um, Kennan actually was, you know, quite astounded and actually quite afraid of um, 
well, not afraid. He was more appalled than he was afraid by what came out of the McCarthy sort of anti-communist movement. Um, so, but we'll get into that later because it does affect him um, and his ability to, you know, communicate and draft policy. Um, rank and file communist parties uh, will also have support. Um, you know, whether, uh, the, you know, yeah, let me read here as a rule, they are used to penetrate and often influence or dominate. And as the case may be other organizations less likely to be suspected of being tools of the Soviet government with a view of accomplishing their purposes through apparent or mission organizations rather than by direct action as a separate political party. Um, so we can see this in regards of working through other institutions. So primarily, for instance, writers, this would be along the lines that, um, the Soviet Union would take um, between 1948 to basically the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union spent millions of um, U.S. dollars, some of that would equate it to be running a small congressional campaign um, inside of Hollywood, uh, you know, the Hollywood blacklisting and whatnot. If there was um, one of the good things that Razor Fist has made is actually talking about the level of Soviet influence that they poured into Hollywood just financially, and that many of the writers inside that time. Um, would, you know, be exposed to ritual public humiliation rituals and have communications, in fact, with uh, communist spies and officials during the 19, late 1940s and 1950s up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And when the KGB archives finally became available to the public, um, the amount of funding was astounding. Um Let's, and again, this is where we see a lot of attitudes change. Uh, for international organizations, which can be similarly penetrated through the influence, such as labor, youth and women's organizations, uh, being the most prominent among them, um, but it's also the international labor movement in general. Keep in mind, this labor at that time was vastly different. The West was still heavily industrialized. The West had seen the Red Scare, especially in the United States in the 1920s, and many labor movements inside of the United States had been quickly called to be associated with the Soviet Union um, from 1917 onward. Um, he was also concerned about uh, racial policy, especially of some sort of pan-Slavic movement, and that the Russian Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church in general would be seen as an avenue for um, spies and subversion to a point where the post-war or the post-revolution Orthodox Church um, especially in New England. Uh, to this day, you can actually find a lot of row core churches and parishes in New England that have American flags inside of their parishes, either in the nave or narthex, um, you know, just alongside their icons and paintings in order to illustrate that they are American uh, to avoid any sort of collaboration or anti-Soviet uh, issues there. But this is also at the same time of utilizing all avenues which had existed inside of the Russian government, despite purges and persecution, to use it for their material. And then continue saying, it may be expected that the component parts of this are far-flung apparatus which will be utilized in accordance to their individual sustain suitability, um, including to undermine general political and strategic importance of major Western powers, um, and doing so by ushering industrial and political unrest to stimulate all forms of disunity. All persons with grievances, whether economic or racial, um, will be urged to spelt, uh, spelt redress, uh, not in mediation and compromise, but in defiant, violent struggle for the destruction of other society. So you will see that the poor will be set against the rich, black against white, young against old, newcomers against established residents, and etc., so any avenue of political uh, disunity or disjointness, and again, you can see where some of Kennan's um, disagreements and dissatisfaction with democracy lay in, is because, you know, despite not reading Schmidt, um, Kennan sort of embraces the idea that p areas in which there is political disagreement, that liberalism tries to ameliorate sort of the simulacra of a civil conflict, um, they are very easy to be weaponized. And in fact, even here in the United States, our own government, uh, we utilize the, the regime utilizes these things where you can set young against old, uh, the newcomers against its established citizenry and in, um, instigating racial tensions. Um, and in fact, during the 2016 election, there was quite a bit of this sort of reiteration being used when they were, uh, I remember Salon, The Atlantic, numerous, um, you know, mainstream publications talking about um, the foundations of geopolitics written by Alexander Dugan, which 
I believe there isn't a really good English translation. There are a few that are out there that are sort of done amateurishly or ran through Google Translate. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'd love to get a hold of a copy. But they had claimed at the time that, you know, Dugan was arguing for the same thing to reinstitute, reinstitute a sort of resurgent Russia, which, of course, had them all up in arms due to uh, the Trump administration and all of the claims of collusion therein. But we're going to get now here to the end. And so practical deductions from the United for in the standpoint of U.S. policy. And this is where Kennan really begins to outline his perspective on what is going to come. Um what is going to come from U.S. policy in the future. So, he argues, in summary, we have a political force committed fanatically to the belief that the U.S., uh, that with the U.S. there can be no permanent uh, modus vivendi that is desirable and necessary, that the internal harmony of our society be disrupted, our traditional way of life to be destroyed, the international authority of our state to be broken, if Soviet power is to be secure. This political force has complete power and disposition over the energies of one of the world's greatest peoples and resources of the richest national territory. It is born along a deep and powerful current of Russian nationalism. In addition, its elaborate and far-flung apparatus for exertion and influence in other countries, an apparatus of amazing flexibility and versatility, managed by people whose experience and skill and underground methods are presumably without parallel in history. Finally, it's seemingly inaccessible to the considerations of reality and its basic reactions. So he argues that Soviet power, unlike Hitlerite Germany, is neither schematic nor adventuristic. It does not work by fixed plans. It does not take unnecessary risks, impervious to logic of reason, and it is highly sensitive to the logic of force. For this reason, it can easily withdraw and usually does when strong resistance is encountered at any point. Thus, if the adversary has sufficient force and makes clear of its readiness to use it, he rarely has to do so. If situations are properly handled, there's uh, there will be no need for, um, for prestige engaging showdowns. Um, so this is where we begin to see that, uh, unlike say Napoleon or a mid-century German, that this is going to be a different sort of power that we're dealing with here, and that strong resistance has to be readily available to encounter at any point. We sort of start to see the buildup of having a long-term presence and a long-term policy towards the Soviet Union. Um, gauge against the Western world as a whole, however, in 1946, uh, the Soviets are still by far the weaker force. Thus, their success will really depend on the degree of cohesion, firmness, and vigor which the Western world can muster. And this is a factor in which it can prove, uh, which is within our power to influence, meaning the United States government. Um, so, uh, for, he points out that Soviet propaganda is innately negative and destructive. Um, he's arguing that this should be readily countered with our, our own versions of this. And speaking of um, propaganda, um, we're actually going to see quite a bit of Walter Littman in today's discussion. Um, but to continue on, he says, Our first step must be to apprehend and recognize for what it is the nature of the movement in which we are dealing. We must study it with the same courage, detachment, objectivity, and the same determination not to be emotionally provoked or unseated by it, to which the doctor studies unruly in an individual. Uh, we must see that our public is educated to the realities of the Russian situation. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this press. Of this press cannot do this alone. It must be done mainly by government, which is necessarily more experienced and better informed on the practical problems involved. Um, we need not to be deterred by the ugliness of the picture. I am convinced that there would be far less hysterical anti-Sovietism in our country today if the realities of the situation were better understood by our people. Um, and the radical anti-Sovietism, this is his sort of position in regards to the um, debate uh, that came really out of the Republican and Democratic parties inside the American government. So keep in mind, um, Kennan was not a strong supporter of the old right isolationism that had dominated the Republican Congresses during the Second World War that especially emerged in the election of 1942. Um, he had concerns about the power of Senator Taft and those that had argued that America's intervention and global engagement in the world had dragged itself into World War II, and there was a lot of blame on FDR for that by its foreign policy, which to some extent is arguably very true, especially if we read um, Mr. Meekin's uh, Stalin war, uh, Stalin's war, or of course his policy towards Imperial Japan and the embargoes that came from there. But of course, again, we're also seeing a significant importance on propaganda. Um, but the health and vigor of our own society uh, must be maintained, which means morale and strong anti-communism. Um, 
And then he finally ends here saying that we must formulate and put forward for other nations a much more positive and constructive picture for the sort of world that we would like to see. Many foreign peoples in Europe at least are tired and frightened by the experiences of the past, especially because the war had just ended, and are less interested in abstract freedom than in security. They are seeking guidance rather than responsibilities. Seeking guidance and rather than responsibilities. Um, as realists will tell you, buck passing. Um, we should be better than able than Russians to give them this, and unless we do, Russia certainly will. Finally, we must have the courage and self-confidence to cling to our own methods and conceptions of human society. After all, the greatest danger that can be um, fall us in coping with this problem of Soviet communism is that we shall allow ourselves to become like those with whom we are coping. End canon. So, um, this allows us to, to get back to our... Um, the, the final part is definitely the, the, the key issue there and sounds of the, that's the key paragraph is the policy that we cannot, you know, end up becoming like them and that we have to have a, a long standing policy and a long standing position of providing a better alternative. Um, and so this is where the ideological and the sort of liberal hegemony takes forward there. This is why, um, unlike those that say, you know, sort of ideological liberal hegemony really begins uh, sort of in the Reaganistic era, this sort of, you know, yuppie capitalist neoliberal revol revolution. Um, John J. Eikenberry, for instance, will tell you, no, it really is 1946, um, mainly due to George F. Kennan, that liberal hegemony begins because we must project both through propaganda and through our security concerns a better alternative politically, strategically, and economically to that of the Soviet Union. Um, which is why, again, um, we, we, we see a lot of that today where America is still really good at fighting the Cold War, um, sort of that old Thomas 777 point, but we'll get to that towards the end. Um, but let me share our um, current, uh, where we left off on today's uh, lecture. Wonderful. Okay. So later this would be written in a year later as Mr. X in Foreign Affairs Magazine. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Um so this is where we really get Kennan's idea of containment. And who do I have pictured here on the right? I have Mr. Walter Littman. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so we'll uh, start with what Kennan acknowledged. Um, while Kennan never read On War by Clausewitz, he did sort of recognize the Clausewitzian ideal of war being a continuation of political intercourse by other means. Um, that the Soviet Union, if met with proper resistance, um, you know, could be met. Um, and it claimed that it was overexpanded in these other areas because it was primarily focused on these inner Soviet affairs. But it did have the capability, as he said, impervious to logic, impervious to the political rationale of the West, especially that of capitalist countries. Um, it loomed over with an inhuman force. And they had seen this by the nature of how the Soviet Union had fought and sacrificed so many of its lives, of its men in the Second World War. So he suggests a long-term, patient but firm and vigilant policy of containment on Russia's expansive tendencies and its abilities to infiltrate, subvert, and support global communism elsewhere. Um, however, the Mr. X article uh, takes it one step further. Rather than just providing sort of the background and what American policy should be, um, he argues that we must solely be our, on guard and ever vigilant and to provide effective, meaningful containment to Marxist Leninism, you know, ideology anywhere that it can. Um, and in turn, Walter Lippmann, you know, the, the author of Public Opinion and numerous other works and was essential and uh, providing an understanding of foreign affairs and reporting in the First World War, um, and also it acknowledged that reporting in the First World War was mainly reporting on what other people had reported because there was no insider knowledge. And that became the you know method in which a lot of the mainstream press still operates today. However, uh, Mr. Lippmann actually grew quite critical of Mr. Kennan's policy for containment and what would emerge to later become the Truman Doctrine. Uh, Walter Lippmann had said that really all that this was going to do was going to generate a vast amount of spending on various satellites, various propaganda outlets across the globe, and force America to be continuously involved in every part of the world at all times in order to counter a threat that, you know, we couldn't effectively ascertain without substantial, um, you know, he, he called it, quote, monstro uh, monstrous, uh, was the main word that he used to describe it. It would need for a constant contact of satellites and alliances to maintain this policy of containment. However, 
believe it or not. Um, these uh, two gentlemen would later reconcile, and many of the criticisms that Lippmann had levied against the policy of containment, um, Kennan would find himself in vast agreement with later on in his career in public service. But um, at this time, George C. Marshall was Secretary of State, and from April 47 to December of 1948, did Kennan ever wield the largest amount of influence uh, at, over Marshall at this time? Um, however, he did have a variety of positions and opinions on what American policy should be in rebuilding the post-war world that would, of course, have differing views to sort of the Cold War orthodoxy that would emerge out of both the Truman administration and those that would follow. So, for instance, he had called for German reunification um, and had argued that, you know, by neutralizing the way that they are and having German reunification, you can have a stronger Western bulwark against the Soviet Union and sort of tell the Soviets to push further back um, from their expanse over Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and in fact, he was rather adamantly opposed to NATO participation um, he, he did not want the United States to be a part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization at this time. However, by the time that George C. Marshall had stepped down, um, he had lost a significant amount of his influence. Um, however, Kennan had a variety of views that would sort of highlight that, um, you know, the positions of decolonialization. Um, Kennan's logic was more to the right than rather to say the liberal perspective that colonialism was inherently bad in terms of liberation. Um, and those kind of ideologies that would um, say that these people should be free, self-determination. Kennan's view, for instance, to that of East Asia, especially when it came to that of the French colonies in Indochina, was is that colonialism would be a breeding ground for so, uh, ethnic and communist tendencies that could easily be supported by the Soviet Union and other communist sympathizers within the territory. Uh, he had argued, especially within areas of Cambodia, what would be you know Vietnam and Indochina, that these territories um, should be the areas of least concern and that there should be a focus outwardly uh, elsewhere. Come the fall of mainland China, um, you know, his position on Taiwan had changed from that of the official policy of the United States. He had argued that Chiang Kai-shek's government in, on Taiwan shouldn't exist, but rather instead it should become rather a protectorate of the United States and to some extent have a control with a more American-friendly government similar to the occupation of Japan post-war that would allow the individual people of Taiwan or Formosa uh, in order to have their own say. He wasn't a strong believer in uh, the ability of Chiang Kai-shek to govern, and he had viewed him as a particularly weak leader uh, to which he had argued for a change in policy. In South America, um, by the time that Dean Atkinson had taken over, um, the role of Secretary of State, where they had numerous disagreements. Uh, his position on Latin America was met with a form of old-style Victorian and ethno-narcissism, in which that uh, had actually found himself in quite hot water with Dean Atkinson, the Secretary of State. He had viewed that um, the basic Spanish and Spaniard policy of basically the encomienda system, Blanca Quinto, had made it impossible to work with effective governance uh, inside South America, despite trying to tour the area in uh, late 1947 and travel around and try and, and create and try and reproach with these nations and, and continue these sort of pan American um, policy that went from being anti fascist to now being anti communist. Um, However, <laughs> this uh, he this made him rather um, get in hot water by Dean Atkinson, who was also a Truman loyalist. This was after the 1948 election um, when Dean Atkinson had begun to take over, and that allowed him to sort of take a position, a step down from the policy planning staff being the director of the board. He would later be succeeded by one of his contemporaries that wouldn't be, in fact, far more militaristic than himself. But his time working at the State Department only had furthered his disapproval of democracy, stating that, again, political and meritocratic class um, could not exist in, an, in a democratic institution where the policy of the nation was at the whims of leaders and the internal political disputes of the day, which would give way to baser instincts. Um, but also during this time, from 47 to 48, he was substantially involved in the Marshall Plan. Um, so most of what became the you know, European Recovery Project 
Um, his idea was how can we expand American interests, not just in the rebuilding of the post-war European economy in the West, but what can we do to expand American interests and influence over the region, not just for years, but decades to come. Kennan had always thought in the long term, not necessarily just what would work for the political expediency of those in power now. Foreign policy in America has always had the, the difficulty, and we'll talk about this on part three when we discuss American diplomacy. Uh, he criticizes American diplomacy within that book in 1951 that, you know, the 20th, the first half of the 20th century foreign policy in America was always derided and contradictory and complex, uh, mainly due to the fact of internal political strife. He always took into consideration the realpolitik that was presented before him, never looking back at home. Um, at the internal domestic disputes of the country, which is partially why he had lost so much influence um, come the fall of China in 1949, because the political situation um, for Truman, who again uh, was pretty much waiting uh, until the 1948 election to, to take office, or well, was waiting, you know, he's unelected at the time, um, come that election uh, when um, FDR had died. So also dealing with the Republican Congress, he was left with a lot of flack within and of himself to deal with. However, you know, Dewey beat, you know, the famous Dewey beats Truman paper. I mean, Truman stays in office until, you know, the 19, uh, until Eisenhower takes office. But along with uh, Mr. Atkinson, he's going to meet some considerable flack in a bit. But if, let's focus right now on the Marshall Plan here. Uh, so the economic recovery was meant to be both realistic and rebuilding Europe in terms of its economies. He wanted to provide them hope, as he would illustrate in the long telegram in 1946, but it also had to be idealistic. If a better alternative to governance in a more democratic or at least a more you know capitalist-oriented, non-Marxist-oriented system could be provided, then it should be within the full power of the United States to do so and effectively create a global chain of these sort of economic and political powerhouses that would serve to be an international alternative to what the Soviet Union was providing. So he basically viewed the idea that these, not only should it be done in Europe, but there should be substantial funding and planning put into place um, by the American government in areas like Greece, Turkey, Iran, North Africa, the Middle East, the Philippines, Japan, and basically throughout um, what he called a great crescent. So just basically this crescent from um, South Korea, what we would also consider to be, you know, the Rimland, you know, compared to the Heartland theory, what we see from those like Speakman and those like McKinder. Uh, he's very aware of those fellows. Um, so basically to create a, a, a great crescent around the Soviet Union with effective political alternatives. However, um, in Cold War Iconoclast, we, uh, you know, Hickson points out that Kennan was substantially against democratic reforms in post-war Europe. He argued that it gave substantial opportunity for the growth of communist movements. Um, and so despite some of the, you know, advances in mo de moderate democratic progressives or democratic socialists at the time, he did not want to give them too much of a voice in political powers, and he argued that they should be treating communists in Western and Central Europe the same way that the policy of denazification took place in Germany at the end of the Second World War. Of course, Secretary of State Dean Atkinson from 1945, 1949 to 1953, um, began as it began to ramp up, Atkinson was far more militaristic. Um, the differences in Asia were rather than uh, the current policies that existed today, um, you know, th this was the fact that Kennan was far more ambivalent on military power. He didn't feel the need to engage in the use of military power or the show of force whenever necessary, and that it would be very wary for Americans to, you know, get involved in long-term political conflict. By this time, he's beginning to agree with a lot of Walter Lippmann's criticisms of his original policy that he had put out is the Mr. X article and, of course, the Long Telegram in 1946 and 1947. He does stay on the policy planning board, um, not as the director, but he stayed on as a general counselor until 1950. He was, and of course, pictured to the right as Dean uh, Atkinson with a, a rather, you know, he's got that mustache. It's pretty good. Um, but he is succeeded by his contemporary, Paul Henry Nitsa, 
Now, NHTSA, as the director of the policy um, planning staff, is far more, um, you know, used to the calculus of realpolitik when it comes to the use of military power. Um, and because of this, uh, Atkinson was more oriented towards the use of military power, especially as policies like from the National Security Council, uh, especially the NSC document 68, uh, begins to really show the disagreements between these two individuals, despite Kennan's uh, expertise as an official on Soviet affairs and what was known at the time as Sovietology or Kremlinolo Kremlinology that uh, would sort of lead him to move further and further away um, from this time. But of course, Kennan stepped down in 49 mainly due to domestic politics. And this is, again, where you see a lot of the anti-democratic views of Kennan really coming full of forth. Um, because at this time, you know, what is the Truman administration dealing with? Uh, it is dealing with the fact that individuals in the State Department had been known to have been bugged or had Soviet spies, uh, you know, implicated in various projects, as well as accusations of treason. And then, of course, the fall of China um, and the rise of Mao Zedong in 1949. So at the time, you know, he's facing significant democratic backlash, President Truman, um, for not being hard enough on the fall of China. There were individuals like, of course, former Vice President Richard Nixon, or well, soon to be former Vice President Richard Nixon, uh, that would call him out for it. And those that would argue that strategies like rollback had to be necessary and that the Republicans were basically raking him over the coals because of this. And in part due to his inability to be more pro uh, military calculus on these affairs, um, basically through Truman and Atkinson, he found himself to step down and was forced out of the position and left until 1950. Um, but this is in part because NSC 68, written in April of 1950 by the new policy planning staff director, Paul Henry Nitza, uh, was focused on one of the three major schools of thought in regards to containment or how to deal with the Soviets during the Cold War. We know these uh, schools of thought is rollback, containment, and detente. Um, containment, of course, being primarily to have an ever-present position, um, primarily through economic means, a, you know, a standing show of force, but nothing that was directly offensive, only just to be there as possible. Um, this containment to maintain that Soviet expansion would be contained and limited to the areas in which it had already existed, that it shouldn't go one step further. Detente later be famously championed by Henry Kissinger and President Richard Nixon uh, during his time in office for more diplomatic and more communicative means for more reconciliation and coexistence to sort of de-escalate the situation. But rollback, of course, is the far more offensive one. Um, to basically counter them wherever they are and to use offensive military pressure wherever that may be. Um, and this is where we start seeing um, both in the end of the Truman administration and the beginning of the Eisenhower administration, the use of advisors, more clandestine operations, um, supporting anti-communist efforts in Turkey and Greece. And finally, um, you know, advisors towards Indochina and assessing the situation with how the French are dealing with it. Um, but it did call for the militarization of the Cold War, and it had led to a lot of areas in which, finally, you know, the idea of what Kennan was arguing for had become far too militarized, and that the Soviet Union at the present time was a threat that could not be contained if left unchecked. Uh, the viewpoint of NSC-68 and its language throughout NSC-68 is the position that the Soviet Union has the military capability, the political capability, and the economic capability, not just within the Soviet Union, but by its means is having a nuclear weapon. Um, and at this point, of course, through the Rosenbergs giving the, you know, uh, being uh, hanged for treason. Um, they had successfully tested the atom bomb um, in 1949. And now America was no longer the unipolar monopoly on nuclear weapons. And later throughout the 1950s and the rest of the 20th century, uh, we would see nuclear power grow to not just the United States and the Soviet Union, although they would have the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons. Um, however, NSC-68 and NHTSA argued that the Soviet Union had the capacity at any point in time to overtake the West, and that they should view this as a primary existential threat because it could not be left unchecked unless it was willing to be met, be met with um, a strong militarized presence that would serve as an effective deterrent and thus, in turn, negate any idea of escalation. Um, so this would mean including hydrogen bomb testing here in America and expansive nuclear testing and nuclear armament readiness 
And in turn, that would probably lead to a lot of what we see from the Strategic Air Command and our, a lot of our ballistic missile research. But in turn, uh, this viewpoint left really no other choice for Kennan, who had grown quite concerned over what this may lead to and exacerbate any potential military conflict in the world, especially now that nuclear weapons were on the table, that he had stepped down from the policy planning staff. However, during this time, this meant that uh, he had another opportunity before him, even though he was no longer with the PPS. Um, he was a point, uh, nominated in 1950, um, 1951. Uh, he was approved for the ambassadorship to Russia. However, um, he would be a very, very short-lived time due to some public remarks that he had made. Um, however, from his time in May and September of 1952, he had noticed the growth of the police state and the ever-growing sense of... Um, lack of security on the Americans' part, where they were not doing a strong enough job in regards to the growth of xenophobia, the distrust of the American embassy, that communications between there, he was always concerned about being bugged, and in fact, at one point in time, he discovered that there was a bug on the door. Um, and I have pictured here the old American embassy building um, that would be there, I think, until 1953, and they had changed buildings in Moscow. But um, in some remarks... In September of 1952, very early on in the month, he had made some remarks about his lodgings, and he had compared them to the lodgings that had been experienced by American diplomatic staff and what he had experienced during his time abroad at the beginnings of hostilities between Germany and the United States after 1941. And of course, the Soviet Union at the time had viewed this as a great political insult that they would be ever dare to compare the Soviet Union to that of the mid-century Germans. Um, the communist Politburo had basically declared him persona non grata, and he had to resign. Uh, later in life, and I think in an interview with Time magazine at the time, uh, I think in the 1960s, he had said, in retrospect, they were some foolish remarks to make, considering that that was somewhat of a dream job of his due to the nature of his expertise and his own personal reading of history. But during the time of the Eisenhower administration, again, this man served um, for over 25 years in the Foreign Service, um, he had numerous disagreements with the far more aggressive and the far more use of clandestine operations, such as that of John Foster Dulles, uh, Eisenhower's Secretary of State. However, Eisenhower was very quick to be concerned about how growing internal political posturings and disagreements between those that he had trusted for national security and intelligence concerns could easily affect poor policy and reflect poor policy abroad. Um, and in fact, this would be a part of Project Solarium. Um, on the picture here that I have on screen, you can see Project Solarium, um, where they would simply just meet, and he's co um, in quail. Um, it was basically just a national uh, exercise uh, in foreign policy in the summer of 1953. It was meant to produce consensus amongst his officials. He, he wanted to make sure that they had an effective strategy um, on responding to Soviet expansionism. This was primarily to basically cool tensions between John Foster Dulles and George F. Kennan. It was at the top floor of the White House, and um, that the guidances set forth under NSC 68 were insufficient to address the issues that the administration was presented with by intelligence and State Department officials, and that it needed a significant course correction to deal with the Soviet Union. Um, this led to numerous other documentations that would basically try and change uh, U.S. policy, um, basically that would stand until the very end of the Cold War. Um, but it was composed primarily of uh, three teams, um, you know, uh, Team A, Team B, and Team C, which contained, you know, both military, um, political leaders, and anyone with significant, you know, trust from um, Eisenhower. So this included a, a lot of the men that he had served with um, during his time in the Second World War. So, for instance, um, George F. Kennan was a part of Team A, uh, and this was mainly political strategy. This was not um, uh, not focused on the military. Those were other teams, uh, B and C, were, were focused on. Um, so Team A was mainly to be the containment option, right? Uh, this is supported policy, um, you know, that had focused primarily on how do we provide political alliances to our allies? What can we do to have the existing policy of containment? What was the best way to show that this was the way that it worked out? Um, so, you know, Kennan was the chairman. Um, John M. Maury of the CIA was there. 
um, Charles Bon Bone Steel the Third, who had served um, in the Second World War as well as in Korea. Uh, so there were quite a few officials there. Um, however, the other teams were focused more so on how do they take a you know what can we do about our you know policy on with regards to nuclear weapons? How can we expand that? And then Team C, led by um, uh, various other individuals, primarily of the military. Um, and then this would be focused primarily on what can we do to be more offensive if it ever came to that territory, uh, if it ever came to that position. How can we fight the Soviets in Soviet-controlled territory? Um, you know, so long as the Soviet Union exists, it will not fall apart, and it, can, it must and can be shaken apart. So ways in which they can try and use offensive means to do so. Uh, thankfully, um, you know, uh, Paul Henry Nitze was not included, despite his military calculus. He was not wanting to include those that were allies of the previous administration. He wanted to focus on his team of rivals and his team of rivals alone. And what emerged out of that was primarily focusing on stronger military pro uh, posture, um, the capability of retaliatory and second strike capability. Um, and that basically this was really just the fact that the U.S. will always consider nuclear weapons and all other munitions available. So we really begin to see a lot of this um, come out of here. But during the 1950s and McCarthyism, which Kennan had been strongly opposed, he had faced significant amount of political backlash to where his, those in Congress that were against him were primarily oriented around keeping... Um, uh, keeping the issue of, um, you know, his uh, positions that were against the sort of traditional orthodoxy um, of the cold warriors at the time. And in fact, his longstanding ally and far more moderate issue on the Cold War, Robert J. Oppenheimer, who you might know from the Ma Manhattan Project, came to his defense in defending his uh, security clearance while many in Congress wanted it revoked, both because of the fact that he had known individuals during his time in Moscow, as well as his time in the Truman administration that had been um, known to have Soviet spies inside them. So this was more of a target of political opportunity, but thankfully it was capped. And um, we can carry on. So during his time there with uh, both an advice uh, to the Eisenhower administration he thankfully had written numerous documentations towards the end of Ike's second term about what steps the next president should take towards the 1960 election. Um, and after that sort of in-between period from November to uh, Kennedy being sworn in, Kennedy had written numerous documents on what uh, the new incoming administration should be doing in regards to the Cold War. Um, despite his sort of, you know, antagonism with the, the Dulles brothers, um, Kennedy had offered him a choice between Poland and Yugoslavia. Uh, Kennan picked Yugoslavia because of his interest in Tito and the non-alignment movement, which he had argued for that would be something that the United States should take advantage of, um, because this non-alignment movement wasn't directly implicated with, you know, Soviet communism, that this would be an opportunity for them to take advantage of it. Um, but he would make it incredibly difficult to do his job in trying to convince um, those of political elites in Tito and Belgrade that, hey, you know, this could be an opportunity for greater relations between the United States and Yugoslavia. Um, but this was primarily due to scandals that had affected it. This was primarily due to two reasons, the U-2 spy incident and the Bay of Pigs invasion, wherein, of course, the Kennedy administration is beset with the fact that it has been spying on the Soviets in ways in which it has not been seen before. Although, think of what you will of these two incidences. Um, it made it very hard for Kennedy to do his job. And in the face of the um, non-alignment movement not being taken as seriously, that there, he argued time and time again that a lot of the speeches towards the United States that came out of the Yugoslav government um, shouldn't be taken at face value, that we should consider that their non-alignment movement is not directly implicated with the Soviet Union, that this could be an opportunity to drive a wedge inside Eastern Europe, um, you know, against the Soviet Union. Um, the American government, especially uh, the more hawkish members of Congress, took it far more seriously, and he would resign his post um, shortly in 1963 before Kennedy's assassination uh, in order to leave towards a more private academic life, realizing that his ability to influence policy in the American government, especially in the wake of this policy debacle over non-alignment, had fallen apart. So 
Uh, that leads us to see with a lot of other questions that he had to deal with as well. You'll notice that his um, resistance to sort of the Cold War orthodoxy, um, especially when it came to the issues of Germany, when it came to the issues of NATO, a lot of these things would change uh, throughout his life. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of these things here, for example. Um, he had written American Diplomacy in 1951, which we will cover in the third and final part of this lecture series. I'm going to have Praise of Folly on to talk about this very famous book. Um, he had also served during his time in between his time in Moscow in 1946 to 1947. He had served as the Deputy of Foreign Affairs at the U.S. Naval College by Admiral Forrestal. Uh, and this is where he had been further convinced to write the Mr. X article. And it became very easy to find out who wrote the Mr. X article because of the classics that he had cited. No one but George Kennan would cite things like the... Uh, fall and decline of the Roman Empire and Russian novels like he did kind of became easy to dox who it was, so to speak. Um, but for instance, on the issue of Germany, uh, he would also talk about 1957 with the uh, Reich lectures that um, the current German partition between East and West Germany would be incredibly dangerous and that this would most likely be an area in which war with the Soviet Union could be fought out. Um, and that it should not be considered to be a permanent or satisfactory view that Germany remains split, that it should be reunified and find any sort of Soviet um, interests in East Germany to be neutralized. But again, these are some of the long-standing things in which he had viewed. He had also argued and criticized that the standing policy should be early on to withdraw from Europe um, as to sort of temper the USSR and maybe find ways to make diplomatic and economic grounds um, in Eastern Europe past the sort of Iron Curtain that it standed at the time. Um, this view would later change um, in support of trying to counter the Soviets everywhere that he could. So as we get to the end of our lecture today before announcements and the Frog of the Week, um, despite Cannon going against the grain of most of his contemporaries, his ideas did formulate the basis of Cold War standing doctrines, both under Project Solarium as well as with the Long Telegram, the, the a lot of the instances of the use of nuclear weapons supporting America's ability of second strike and retaliatory capabilities and a long-standing policy of being able to counter the Soviets wherever they lay would be the logic that would allow and decide the issues of the you know domino effect when it came to East Asia, especially ramping up America's involvement in Vietnam. Um, but it also shows us how, even to this day, the United States foreign policy system is really, really good at fighting the Cold War, as Thomas Seven Seven and Paul Gottfried point out. Uh, to this day, we still see containment of strategy through economic and strategic means. Um, we can see this most especially with China as there's comparisons of a new uh, growing Cold War, um, which has been criticized both by realists but as well as leftists, which we discussed on as a subscribe star exclusive just the other day about what that might look like. For instance, the Obama administration thought about economic containment of China by integrating them into an international um, community uh, through either the Trans-Pacific Partnership and bolstering its allies. But even to this day, the idea of containment and engaging in Cold War 2.0, whether it's the America's Competes Act or um, trying to invest more in tech sector education and uh, even the more hawkish attitudes of like Senator Josh Hawley and others, Still, that Cold War mechanism and thought process still exists today. However, his views on governance remain to be examined, and that will be for part three of our wonderful um, lecture series on George F. Kennan. And that will um, allow us to transition very smoothly towards announcements. Um, so, some announcements. Uh, there will be no Sunday stream next week. I will be out of town. However, the week after, I'm going to do um, the third and final part where we talk about a lot of Kennan's writings and his works. This includes American diplomacy around the Cragged Hill and some of his memoirs. Praise the Folly will be joining me on this one. Um, the latest episode of the Digital Archipelago is on Geo's channel. Um, there should be one out this week. I'm going to have to coordinate with Geo and our guests to pre-record. We're going to be talking about some, uh, I think we're going to be referring to mainly internet mythology. Um, given the fact that our, our guest, who I will leave unannounced, but um, they are an expert in a lot of sort of the internet mythology where a lot of these memes, a lot of these subcultures originate from. Um, a new substack, of course, is available on the importance of community and learning from our elders. That's uh, see the community tab. Um, a real talk is in the works. It's going to be on the subject of political archaeology. Um, and it's going to be really long. It's probably going to be around 30 minutes or so. I've got that one will be actually mainly scripted out. 
And um, I put on a new camera stand. There are three fish that are caught in the video. I think that you guys will really, really enjoy that. And then every week, what will happen is, is that I will take articles that my patrons suggest or someone can email me and say, hey, well, why don't you read through this? And I call it Flipping Through Foreign Affairs. Uh, we have the first one of the series out already on Subscribestar, so all the more reason to support the channel. Um, you'll get access to sort of live readings and reactions and analysis to articles that came out. We did a really, really uh, fun uh, cringe reading of this um, article that came out that said uh, great power competition is bad for democracy, where basically um, like just your most basic sort of like shit liberty arguments about, you know, the climate, equality and anti-racism. Uh, it's, it's real bad when we focus on, you know, geopolitical rivals and our issues therein. It's quite an interesting article. We, we, it's about an hour long little rant and rave on some cringe. So if you're interested in seeing how I'll react to both bad and good um, scholarly, as well as um, opinion piece articles from foreign affairs and other uh, international relations pieces, all the more means to subscribe that will always be exclusive to our wonderful backers. But uh, with all that being said, um, let's uh, move on towards everyone's favorite part, which is that of uh, Frog of the Week. Alrighty, so uh, this week's Frog of the Week is the American Oak Toad. It is the smallest amphibian in North America. Well, it's the smallest toad in North America, but all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Anyways, you can find these little fellas along the, uh, along and all in Florida and along the eastern seaboard in the American South, going as far up as North Carolina. Uh, these guys are about the size of an American nickel. Um, they don't get much bigger than about an inch um, to maybe 1.1 inches from, you know, snout to rear end. Uh, these little round boys here. You can tell which ones are male and which ones are female by the vocal sac found on the male over here. Very good boy. And you can tell, of course, that, you know, that the female is going to be, of course, a little bit bigger and a little bit rounder. They have a sexual dimorphism as all amphibians tend to do so. But they do have a distinctive and loud... Um, mating call, despite being so small, it's very loud squeak um, from the vocal sac on the male. Uh, they mainly eat insects and other anthropods, but the small boy here has a strong diet preference from ants. They do have a short lifespan of roughly four years with a rapidly developing spawn. Usually only takes 24 to 36 hours after the eggs have been fertilized for them to start doing their business and start developing as tadpoles. And they usually lay about 500 eggs when they uh, go to spawn. And that is usually in little branches of like eight to 10. And they're usually preferenced for swamps, streams, but mainly humid climates. Um, that's why, of course, they're along the seaboard areas of rain um, and standing water. So ponds, swamps, marshes, things like that. And that is, everyone, our wonderful frog of the week, this little small boy here, the oak toad. And uh, now we're going to get to uh, super chats and, um, of course, shilling if we... We usually shill if we've got guests, but I do have some things to shill for you all. Um, I do want to thank my top tier patrons on here. Fearless Leader, Raging Mantral, User 4A, 5B, 5D, B5, Cowering Bugman, Preservatism, Focron, Consumer, and Hunger. These gentlemen donate $20 or more, or more a month on Subscribestar. They're wonderful people. They get access to great things. They have the opportunity if they would like to come on, um, like Raging Mandrel has in the past when we discussed uh, restraint or other topics. Um, and that allows them to come on. And Hunger has been fantastic at this as well, helping us understand the Lebanese situation even better. So all these things to come in mind with uh, supporting the channel. You get access to some great stuff. Uh, anything that I put behind a paywall, you guys have access to, along with some other goodies. And of course, um, there's the wonderful merch link. We can't go a day without our Frog of the Week mug and its numerous designs. But uh, there were a few super chats that came in. I did not pay attention to chat this much, uh, as much this time, ladies and gents. 
Um, this was a, a pretty in-depth info chalked um, lecture today. So next, not next week, but the weekend after is going to be a very good time when it comes to um, talking about his writings. Because man, this guy, just the depth of work that he has is crazy. And of course, if you're new to the channel, uh, this is what we do every Sunday, as the name implies. And we're very close to hitting 7K, and we're doing fantastic on that end. So I wanted to thank you guys so much for the level of growth that I've experienced as of late. I'm always thankful for it. Um, but uh, I noticed that we had saw um, at the very beginning of the stream, uh, Narco Republican became a member of the sort of frog tier channel membership. You get access to stuff that is behind the paywall. So anything that I make, you know, for patrons to see exclusively or... Um, stuff that they want to see early, they can. And then um, we also have some super chats that came in. So I want to get to those real quickly. Um, here we go. Let me go view them all. I think it was just one today, which is fine by me. Your support's always wondered, uh, always, always accepted and always, always want, welcomed with a grateful heart. Um, for five euros from Monothalmos, thank you so much. Uh, he says, happy 86th anniversary uh, of the coup against the Second Spanish Republic. So, um, one of these days I should probably talk about that in a history sense more. So, plenty of stuff to go along the way. But of course, Monothalmos, thank you. I do want to give Monothalmos just a personal public shout out because he's on Twitter and he will DM me all the time about stuff that doesn't make it into like my like meteor Twitter feed, or he'll tell me what's going on with like the ECB or something. And I'm, I'm gratefully, um, I, I'm very thankful for it. Um, Raging Mantral 10 K celebration win. Uh, well, when we get there, I mean, that's, that's the big one to celebrate, right? Is 10 K, uh, both on Twitter and on, um, YouTube. So uh, hopefully on YouTube, we'll, we'll get to 10 K on its own path. I've got some great stuff planned in the future. I know in August, I'm going to have the guys from the new right podcast, W R I T E. We're going to talk about art, writing fiction, and sort of the things that we've, all the friends we've made along the way. And, uh, I'm working on a few other people that I want to have come on and interview, but in the meantime, I still have a lot of work to do. On Twitter, we're very close to 10K, and I've been told 10K is when you start grifting your book or start shilling it. Um, and so what I will have, I'm not going to re release the title because I don't want one of you guys to take it from me, but we are going to have um, an essay collection book out by the end of the year. Uh, I've got most of them written. Um, there will be quite a few of them. One of them will be coming out this week behind the paywall, sort of as my chapter one, sort of the like introductory essay of why I'm writing this, who I am, what I do. And uh, that'll be out soon by the year's end. It'll be a great Christmas gift uh, for those of you who want to have just a nice observation from what it's like in the middle of the country and looking at the rest of the world and my government. Uh, but a lot of, uh, you know, cultural observations as well. So the stuff that you've seen on my Substack so far, if you're subscribed to it, then you'll see a few of those in there as well. So everything from religion to culture to, you know, being with nature and things like that. There'll be a few, you know, um, Wendell Berry appreciation essays in there as well. But that's what I've got going on. And I wanted to thank you all for your support. And I'm not going anywhere. And things are going pretty darn well. Um, so not next, not this weekend, but the weekend after, we are going to be at um, the uh, third part of this lecture series. The first one of many that I want to do is sort of a biographical policy history oriented viewpoint of our geopolitical thinkers and scholars of our contemporary age. So um, that, that, that's what's to come. So I think in the future, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to give some special attention to Halford McKinder and um, Alfred Thayer Mahan, because we've talked about, you know, the influence of sea power among nations in world history, but these gentlemen deserve their proper biographical um, streams and lectures as well. And I think it's important that we know the lives of what got these men to, uh, to really be who they are. So until then, I will always update you when I'm on new streams, new podcasts and interviews. There's plenty of stuff to do. And until then, I want to appreciate you all for your kind and wonderful support. Let me go um, wish you all a farewell this way. Let me go turn my camera on. But yeah, so plenty of stuff to come. I'm greatly thankful for everyone to take the time today to come out and support. Um, I know that I think someone else was streaming today, and if I was overlapping with Apostolic Majesty, I sincerely apologize. But again, this stuff will always be here for you all. I'm not going anywhere. And... Um,
uh, if you want to dab on Moldbug, I think that we can happily shill uh, the distributist who on this Tuesday will be streaming on that issue. So have no fear. Um, and I think the only thing I've got on my horizon will be something this week with uh, Walter Russell, who's been doing some phenomenal work on philosophy and interviews. So just keep that all in mind. Um, but again, always check the community tab, always check Telegram, and always check Twitter. So with that, I'm going to leave you all to have and enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening. I hope that you've all had a fantastic one so far and that you've learned something. And until then, guys, be prudent and take care. I'll see you around.